question because it's about, uh, it, it's a, I don't want to come across self-righteous, you know, it's about me, look at what I'm doing and all the rest of that. Everything that God has me where I am now is through him, through my flesh and through myself and through the world. I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing. This is through him. I do not have the strength on my own to, uh, to do what I do. It's all through him and through the Holy Spirit. So with that said, um, we're supposed to talk a little bit about what, what God is doing in our lives. Well, the thing, the difficult is, is that to get from, to hear where we are, there's always a journey involved. There's always a way that we got here. My journey started, and I'll just hit this in some of the highlights. I was born and raised in Minneapolis. I was not raised in a Christian family. Uh, matter of fact, it was fairly dysfunctional. But uh, I had a grandmother who made sure every Sunday that we went to church. When I was 14, a baseball coach that I belonged to uh, led us to Christ and got us to a better understanding of that. When I was 16, I wanted to be a pastor. My folks told me that was the second dumbest thing they'd ever heard and talked me completely out of it. So from that point on, um, I did have Jesus in my head, but I went on about my life. Um, I went into the military. I was in the service for five years. Uh, it, it's, interesting how <laughs> it's interesting how God shows up. Uh, when you're called up to sit down and make out your last will and testament before you're ready to deploy, um, it brings some reality into play. And you're looking for hope and, and all that. And, and Jesus showed up in my life again. That was the, uh, um, that's the first time I'd read the Bible through completely was while I was in the service. I got out of the, I, I met my wife while I was in the service, got married, got out of the service, um, came back to Brainerd um, uh, up until for the, for the next 30 years. Um, I was a good guy. I considered myself a Christian, but I didn't know what it meant. Of course, I didn't know I didn't know what it meant. Uh, my wife became part of a Bible study that uh, uh, was meeting at the school, and I was not going to attend that. As a matter of fact, I would give her a hard time periodically in half jest when she'd come home asking her how her cult meeting had gone. And eventually, the, uh, the they got said they had to leave the school, and they came to my house. I couldn't hide anymore. And I knew most of the people in the study. We were friends. Uh, I, did, I had my own business. I did business with them and all that. So they came. So I couldn't hide anymore. I, I ended up in that group. They allowed me to be stupid. They allowed me to be arrogant. They allowed me to say what I thought and all that. And then they just gently brought me back to reality. God used them. I credit that group to this day for saving my life. Um, that group also, in God's journey, uh, eventually turned into 12 of us, which were called to start a church. And so we put a call out for a pastor, and uh, the Journey North was born in my living room. Uh, I can't even describe the experience and the blessing and the work uh, that was involved in that. But again, it's part of the journey. God is shaping me. He's forming me. He's bringing me along. You know, all the rest of that. I'm learning and all the rest of that. I moved to Florida. Uh, um, uh, Going to do missions out of there. Ended up up in Alaska. Ended up back in Brainerd. Ended up in uh, on the Gunflint Trail. And you know where that is. We ran a church camp up there for eight years. Um, awesome, awesome experience. Um, came back from there, uh, ended up here at Communitas for a number of reasons, and um, been here for probably eight, nine years, was an elder here for a little over six years. Um, God is constantly forming me and shaping me as I go. Uh, today, uh, about five years ago, we were called, I was called to start a, a ministry called Reflecting the Light. Reflecting the Light is a ministry that serves those that serve. We're we serve the community that serves Native American and, and First Nation uh, uh, peoples groups. Uh, we do uh, grounds work, property works, building remodels for pastors, missionaries, uh, ministries that um, uh, serve Native American 
Um, uh, some of you in this room have been part of that, are part of that, and uh, and that's how this all they've you know, all come together with you know to join us, and uh, as we join Jesus in His work. Our our bottom line is always to serve for the lost. Our broken is for salvation. You know, our our hearts are broken for that. God has also allowed me to be a part of a uh, of a, uh, a, a missionary project, a disciple training center in Keystone, South Dakota, called the Keystone Project. Keep that in your head. It's a little bit of a uh, advertisement. Look it up online. It's called Keystone Project. Unbelievable discipleship training center. International. They come from all over the world to attend this thing. He's allowed. They've. I have, I've been, they've been allowed, God has allowed me to be part of that board, part of that training. I go out there regularly to help with that. Um, it, it's amazing. It's unbelievable. It's, it's a life changer if you ever get the opportunity to attend. It costs you nothing to show up, and they'll house you and feed you. Um, unbelievable. Um, I'm trying to think where else God has got me. He's got me uh, involved in a build program through Oak Hills College. Any of you are familiar with that? Um, he has me um, where we take training down to the reservations, down to church leaders, pastors. Uh, for example, on the reservation, most of them are pastors because you're the smartest guy with the Bible and all the rest of that. So you're the pastor. They have no formal training and all that. Through Oak Hills, we go down there through the build program and we do it for two years, once a week for a month. And we give these church leaders training. Um, they they do uh, uh, it's uh, pretty much church 101 is what what does church look like what does ministry uh, missions look like what does church finances stuff like that uh, what's the redemptive history of God anyways I think my five minutes is up um, but God is moving in my life uh, He's given me the strength and the courage to do this and it's all through Him and again through the working of the Holy Spirit. Um, one of the things that I've learned and he showed me is, is you want to know what faith looks like? Well, it looks like a work. Read James. James will make that very clear for you. The, and the last thing I'm going to leave you with is the condition of your heart is important. The position of your feet is what makes the difference. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. Lord, we thank you for, for Bob and the work that you, where you've placed him. We pray for the people that are impacted by these various ministries. Lord, we see that you are continually on the move. Pray especially for the pastors who are, who are ministering on, um, on the reservations and the First Nation people. Lord, that you would continue to bring hope and help and healing. Amen. At this time, uh, we are go we are in the book of Hebrews, and so just as a reminder, so Hebrews is uh, was likely a sermon that was preached to a group of uh, of Jewish Christians living in and around Rome, and uh, was written down and then shared uh, throughout the uh, kind of the early church circles. And uh, so we're we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter two today. If you have a paper Bible and you want to pull that out. Feel free, we're we'll going to be looking at just the first uh, Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 9. And uh, if you have a paper Bible, just kind of, it's toward the, the end of the New Testament, you'll see a bunch of T names, uh, Timothy and Titus and First and Second Thessalonians. Um, and then if you get into some J names, like a bunch of First Johns and Jameses and things like that, you've gone a little bit too far. Sandwich in the middle there is Hebrews, and uh, Jewel will be reading our passage for us today. attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. 
For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything of subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the middle of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to make therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Thank you, Jewel. Lord, we thank you for your word and that we're able to, to gather together and read it. We pray that it would continue to inform us and who we are by understanding more clearly who you are. Amen. All right, kids, we've got a great time planned for you back this way. Feel free to follow Ollie and Solomon, and if you can catch up with Molly, good luck. And so we thank you, Lord, for these kids and for uh, Casey and, and Morgan for Georgiana and Judah, Silas, Solomon, Truett, a bunch of the other heads that I still don't recognize. Lord, we pray that we would continue to grow in likeness of your image. Lord, we know that those who are teaching these, these young children, that's not a second-class occupation. That they are not the future of the church, they are the church. We are the church. And so we pray that from cradle to grave we would honor you, we would be ever abiding in you, continuing, growing more and more like you. Amen. Uh, pop quiz. Um, yellow signs on the road. What are those? Caution, there we go. I think we got a picture of some of them. Uh, I think these are more bike specific, but uh, 
there's, it's, there's caution, right? Because you're on the road, and for the most part, you're just cruising along, and then all of a sudden, you know, maybe it's uh, uh, especially like, you know, so coming north on 25, there's like this one bend, and then there's a bend back the other way, or on 23, there's a couple. And it's, it's nice because at nighttime, you're cruising along, and, and all of a sudden, you see these yellow signs in the distance, and they reflect, and they show you, hey, look, the road's going to bend a little bit. So uh, if it's icy, maybe uh, step off the gas, slow down a little bit, tap the brakes, see how you're doing. Um, but there's these warning signs, right? And they call us, they're not, uh, they, they tell us to kind of pay attention. And so this is what this section of Hebrews is trying to do. And that's what the author of Hebrews is trying to do. He's trying to get attention and say, pay attention to what's going on. Um, so let's just pick it up here at, in Hebrews chapter two. It says, therefore, um, anybody uh, heard the, the old phrase of whenever you see therefore in the Bible, you have to ask, what's the therefore, therefore? Um, so just a helpful little nugget. So whenever you're reading through the scriptures and you see a therefore, you go, okay, what is the therefore, therefore? What, what is going on before what the author is about to say that is important? All, everything that he's about to say is predicated or hangs on or is a result of something that he just said. And so to summarize uh, Hebrews 1 really quickly, Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. The people are going, yeah, the prophets, they're cool. Moses, great. Angels, great. Jesus, greater. Therefore, as a result of that, he says, we must pay close attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And so this sign, um, these words, is kind of a, it would bring up a nautical image. And so if you've ever spent any time on a lake uh, or out sailing, or I've, I've sailed one time in my life, um, that was interesting. But if you spent any time on the water, um, you know, what, what happens uh, when, when you, if you, if you're not actively steering or maneuvering the boat, are you, do you stay in one spot? If you, if you don't have an anchor, what happens? You drift around, right? And so this image would be was that the, the boats would be coming along and, and they would, and if the, if you weren't paying attention, um, along the, the Mediterranean Sea, there's these little harbors and alcoves and things where you could go in, you'd still be in the water, but you'd be protected from the storm. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, look, that is what we're prone to. We're prone to, as the song says, prone to wander, prone to drifting. And so what happened was these boats would be coming by, and if you weren't paying attention, if you weren't noticing the direction of the wind, how the waves are moving, you could drift past the harbor. Now, if you're in a, in a motorboat, what do you do? You just turn around. No big deal, right? If you're in a sailboat, what do you do? You keep on going, and what do you hit? Rocks. Do rocks and boats go well together? No. Just the same as our souls don't go together when, when we're inattentive and, and, it's, and, and we just drift past the harbor of the home of Christ. And so what the author is saying is, hey, pay attention, be anchored, be moored to the truth of Christ. Because we're prone to wandering away. Anybody here uh, tend a garden? in the summertime, okay? Anyone ever here driven past a field in the summertime? What, 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 ha what do we do in the springtime? We plant, we kind of till, we get things ready, we prepare. Then what do you do the rest of the summer? There are these things that pop up that you don't want to have. They're called weeds, and so you're, we're constantly weeding. What happens if you, if you don't? Has anybody ever, uh, you know, just left, uh, just left the garden unattended? What happens? Right? I mean, sometimes you get, you get, you know, you get, you get some produce, but what else do you get a lot of? Weeds. Lots and lots of weeds. And, it's, and, and the author is, is trying to get us to see that the same is true of our soul. This is the pattern of, of the world. Is that since the fall, that, that the wilderness and disorder and chaos has sought to creep in and to overtake and if we aren't actively pushing back and creating space and paying attention and being rooted and uprooting and weeding and being attentive to the fruit that the Lord has promised to bring to fruition, we're going to drift. We're going to be overtaken. 
So what, what's going on here? What's, what's been happening is that, um, so let's, let's keep going. So, so for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. It was attested by those who heard. Well, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. That makes sense, right? No. Okay. So what's going on here is that he's saying, hey, look, we heard this message declared by angels. What was that message? He's hearkening us back to the Hebrew scriptures. And he's saying, look, if, if we received a message because they believe that the, the angels were the ones who delivered the messages and like we're, we've been spoken through the prophets, like, hey, look, if, if that message was really good, if that was so good, uh, you know, what was the fruit of that message that was really good? What was the fruit of the message received throughout the Old Testament? Did, did the people of God all of a sudden become uh, more and more like who God had made them to be, or did they drift the other way? If, you've, if this is the time, if you've read the Old Testament, feel free to speak aloud. Fill us in. The, the drift, right? Like, it doesn't all, like, there's some really great things that happen, but there's also, man, kind of a dumpster fire at times, right? And it's tough. He said, okay, if the, if the, if the prophets came and, and, and that message was so good and we didn't listen to that, like, what's going on? So, this is, this is the, so, so God the Father, in his great mercy, sends us the Son. He's like, look, if, if Moses wasn't good enough for you, if the prophets weren't good enough for you, if the angels sent by God himself weren't good enough, I'm going to send you the Son. And so the author of Hebrews is going, look, this is the greatest message that you can get. It doesn't get any greater than this. So pay attention to it. But what's happening and, and what's going on with the folks then is, is, um, is they, they'd had their, their hope in a system. They'd hoped for a long time in this system given to them. And, and the system didn't work because systems intrinsically have errors and holes in them, right? And so they thought, well, this system is going to help me put things back together, and it didn't. And, and so then they, they were looking for a new system, because that's what we do, right? If we look, and if we think about, and then we're going to get more into um, Genesis 1, is, or excuse me, Genesis 3. So the result of the fall, we move in one of two directions. Apathy or control. These are the directions that Adam and Eve take. We go from, we don't have our needs and we're uncertain what's going on. When we, when we feel that things are not as they are to be, we either move toward apathy or we move toward control. We get really, really, you know, rigid about, oh, here's this system. I'm going to, we just got to stick to the plan, lock it down and go. Or we get overwhelmed and we kind of eeyore our way through it and we go, oh, I don't know, stuck again, whatever, can't be helped. And we toss our hands up and we drift away. Neither way is helpful. And so what's happening is, is that the people are understanding, they're realizing their guilt. They realize what's going on. They've gone, okay, look, I, I've, I've read the law, I've read all these things, and, and they're feeling that weight, and it's pressing in on them. And then they receive the good news of Jesus. The good news of Jesus has told them, it says, hey, look, all that system that you, that you, were, you were thinking was going to save you, a Savior has come, and he's offering you this gift of mercy and grace. He's, he's what that system was pointing toward, what the system was alluding to, what the system was a picture of. That has come in the flesh and has brought you from the, the defeat of sin to the dominion of the reign of Christ. And the people are like, I'll taste and see and know that that's good. But they just have the appetizer. And then they, they start to, to step back. They start to peace out. They start to neglect their salvation. They, they, they're just like, oh, I'm fading back toward the system because they're like, what, what Jesus is calling me to is a little bit too difficult. What Jesus is calling me to is a little bit too hard. So what's going on here? The, 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 the very, the, what's happening is that they're moving away. And now is the moving away the problem? Is, is, is the moving away the error? It, it, it is an error but it's, it shows us what's going on deeper within the soul. Because 
even as, as Bob said, the, 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 the heart is important, but the feet are also important. And so when the feet start to move, we have to start to wonder what's going on within the heart. And so as the feet are drifting away, it's because the heart has drifted. The heart is no longer trusting in Jesus. So their, their, their drift is a result of unbelief. They're starting to believe in something else. They're starting to believe in something that they used to know. They're believing the lie that what they used to know, what used to kind of work, was okay. And so there's this great irony. Was, was when they were apathetic and just kind of drifting, it wasn't working. Or when they had control, and, and so we seek to, to, to fix our brokenness by the very system that reveals our brokenness. By the very thing that shows us that we're broken, we think, oh, I can overcome it through that. It's like thinking, well, if I, if I hurt myself one way, if I just do that again, then I won't get hurt. Right? Like, oh, surely the way to heal myself when I, when I touch the hot stove is to touch the hot stove again, right? It makes no sense to us when we think about it that way, but that's, that's what we end up doing so often spiritually. So we go, I'm, I'm going to revert back to safety. I'm going to go back. Where it, it, and he's, he's, he, Hebrews is inviting us to grow up, to become mature. Right? How many of us hit points um so anybody can think back to maybe like for me i remember going from elementary school and then there was going to be some really big changes once i got to middle school and junior high i'm going to be responsible for some things i'm going to do things differently anybody else have that realization where you're like oh i have to like remember a locker combination i have to like find my class schedule and go places and and we needed to change now, if, if I'd have gotten to junior high, and at the end of junior high, I went, you know what I'd rather do is go back to, go back to elementary school. Would, would my parents have thought that that was wise? Would, would we as people look back and go, yeah, that's, that's the right maneuver. Go back to what you knew and what was safe. When I was coming out of junior high and going into high school, there were other things that were going to shift. I was going to have to make more choices about the various classes that I was going to take. And as I got out of high school and started talking about what sort of jobs am I going to take? If I were to go and to revert back to patterns that worked for me in high school or worked for me in junior high or in elementary school, what would we say? Would we say that's wisdom or that's immaturity? We'd say that that's fairly unwise, fairly immature. And so Hebrews is saying, don't do that spiritually. There are, not that, not that the, that, that, that growth in faith is, is strictly linear. It's far more cyclical than we're often aware of in, in Western society. But, but we are called to grow. We are called to mature. And so the author of Hebrews is writing to a group of people that are, are hitting various walls and hitting certain points, and they're going, nope, I, I just can't do it. I've got to go back to where it's safe. I've got to get back to where it's comfortable. Jesus, I, 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 know, I know that you're there. I heard the story about the time that you asked the guy to, to step out of the boat. And he said, I just, I just don't want to do it. I just can't. I'm not ready. I'm too scared. And so the author of Hebrews gives us this note. He says, now it was not to angels. So he appeals to our identity. He says, look, it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come. It's to you. He's, he's hearkening us back to the, to the creation mandate in Genesis 1 which is to go out to be fruitful, to multiply, to, to, to put the world subject to you. This is that you are going to be my, my ambassadors. I'm going to give you the gift of my goodness and my dominion that you would go out and you would proclaim it and show it to all the world. That everybody, every person, every being would know the greatness and the glory of God. He says that is your identity. That is your occupation. That is what you are to be about. This wasn't to angels that I gave that to. He said I gave it to you. And so the author is reminding of this, that we need to believe this in our souls and know this in our hearts. He says, it wasn't to the angels that he subjected the world to come. He says, because of which of you he said that what is man that you are mindful of him? What son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. This is a reflection of, of, from, from Psalm 8. And the psalmist is recognizing, yeah, it's just for this little bit of time. Are we lower than angels? But you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. I mean, he's bringing us forward to the future reality where, where death and the defeat of sin will come 
under the dominion of Christ. This is by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus that sin no longer has hold on us, that the death and the devil can no longer have any authority over us. This is it. The Lord is mindful of you. He cares for you. He's tending to your soul. Just as a master gardener would tend to a garden, he's guiding us in our ability to attend to what is with us. He says that you are kin to God the one who is who has the power of the universe. And where sin has brought defeat, he brings back dominion. And Jesus shows us the life which is ideal, attached to God, serving others. And he returns us to God, something that we cannot do on our own. And so the people are going, and he's inviting them to trust in that. He's inviting them to trust in that good news to look to the former ways and to go, that didn't work. I'm not going back there. I'm moving toward this. I don't know. I don't understand. I might not have it all together. It doesn't make all the sense in the world, but I'm going in that direction because I trust that Jesus is good. The author of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is greater than our present joys and our present concerns. He's greater than our past sins. He's greater than our future hopes. Because he is our present joy. He has forgiven our past sins and he is in guiding us to our future hope. One of the things I love about this passage is that it it shows us the attentiveness of God. How often when we when you move toward apathy or move toward control, is it is it the result of of a a flared up ego, right? An in a, a, a violated sense of self. where we're going, I've got to do it on my own, or we come face to face with the fact that we can't and we want to give up. And Hebrews reminds us, what is man that you are mindful of him? Think about that. The Lord is mindful of you. The Lord's attention is toward you. The Lord hears your cry. When you rejoice, he hears that. When, when you are sorrowful, he sees you. When you are angry, he is with you. When you are confused and you are hurting, he is present. When you are weary, he provides rest. So he's saying, don't turn away from that Lord and go back to a system that isn't going to work. Continue to trust in God. So often we're, 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 we're prone to, to moving back toward that. And then the same thing that happens to the unattended garden is what happens to our souls. It becomes overgrown. It becomes a place of, of thorns and thistles, weeds and not good fruit. But there's good news where sin was thought to have the final word, where defeat was present. Jesus brings dominion. Jesus puts all things subject to himself, including our woes, including our sin. So the sin that you've experienced, the the barriers that you have that you think, I can't get there, I can't trust in the Lord, I, I, I can't become who he has created me to be, I can't fully reflect the imprint of his nature that he's placed upon me, that's a lie. Because those who follow Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The love of God resides within you. You are ambassadors sent out to show the greatness and the glory of God. And so by understanding that Jesus is greater, it just encourages us to keep going, that Jesus is in our present right now, and he is guiding us. And so the author of Hebrews in the beginning says, pay attention. Pay attention to what the Lord is doing. Consider what he has done allow to move you closer to trust. I heard someone say at one point in time, we don't change in fuzzy land. We don't change in fuzzy land. So often we say, ah, you know, I, I, I'll get it. 
you know, like when you get up in the morning and you go to work or you go about your day or, you know, you're going to make breakfast or make coffee, like, is there an order of operations to that? Like, sometimes I mix it up. Sometimes I, uh, I'll start the coffee before I put the water in. Does that work out super well? No, you just get a really hot pot <laughs> and no coffee. Doesn't work out very well. Or sometimes I forget to empty the tea before I pour the water in, and so I get like day yesterday's tea, and it just doesn't taste the same. And so the, the Lord is guiding us, and there's a particular order, and, and there's a way to go. And throughout the ancient Near East, there's all sorts of, I mean, and, and, and even today, we look at the myriad of options that are available to us of ways to go. And it can be really overwhelming, it can be really confusing, and the good news is Jesus says, come, follow me. And sometimes we can think, oh, I can't, I can't get to where this person was. And Jesus is like, no, kill the comparison. Be done with that. Don't compare yourself to them. Look at me. Just take the, the next step. Do the next right thing you know to do. I heard a story the other day. A friend of mine was telling me about a conversation he had with a, with a gal who had been teaching Sunday school for 39 years. She'd been involved with youth ministry in her church for 39 years. I was like, that is longer than I have been alive. Longer than I've been alive, this woman has been faithfully serving in her church doing the same thing in and out of season for 39 years. How did you get involved in that? And he, she's like, my son's class needed a Sunday school, and I wanted him to go, and he was kind of attached to me, so I started teaching his class. Then he grew up and moved on, and I taught the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and then they were done, and I just kept going. Little itty-bitty steps saying yes to God, paying attention to what he's doing and trusting in that next step. Trusting that the next right thing you know to do is where he's leading you. And so we pay attention. And this is going to look different in different stages, right? And so maybe you've, you've just come to an awareness of, of who God is. Maybe you're, you're, just, you're growing in your faith and you're just wildly excited about, about who God is. You're moving and you're accepting your self-worth. Stepping out of isolation and into community. Becoming more and more aware of who the Lord is. You may, maybe you've been in discipleship and you're, you're trying to wonder, so it's accepting who you are and how the Lord is gifting you and take risks to move forward in that direction. To steward what the Lord has given you. And look back and remembering those moments where those gifts have, have been used by God. And maybe you've been active and serving for a long time and you're just kind of stuck and you're wondering what the next step is and, and what does increased vulnerability look like to retool the metrics of what success is and kill the ego that the Lord would continue to abide in you. So where are you at this morning? Take a moment and just think about where you're at. Because the author of Hebrews is, is writing to a church that is very much reticent to to the church throughout the age. This is a, this is a problem that we, we continue to wrestle with. That Jesus is greater than anything that we could fathom. He's greater than our present worries and joys. He's, he's overcome our, our past sins. And he's greater than our future hopes. And, and yet we, we so quickly revert back. So where do you see yourself in this story? Maybe, maybe you identify with the author. Where you're constantly jumping up and down and you're just tired of telling people, look, Jesus is greater and watching them walk away. And maybe you're, you're growing and, and for the first time you're, you're having to wrestle with, with your self-worth being based not on what you see, but on what the Lord has done and who the Lord is. Maybe You've been aware of the Lord and now you need to accept the way the Lord has gifted you and take the risk to use that gift. Or you need to remember those moments where the Lord has, has given you the opportunity to do that. To not be afraid, but to respond in loving obedience. To trust in the Lord. Maybe you've been hitting it for hard for a long time. And you're fatigued. What does the vulnerability of that look like? 
how you continue to let go of the ego that says, look at me and what I've done. And continue in the abiding love that says, look at God and what he has done. And we continue to be overjoyed by that. And then it's his dominion that, that informs our success. And so where do you see yourself in the story today? What is the Lord drawing to your attention? How is he changing you? How is he working in your life? And so often to, to resonate with, with what the scripture is saying, and I don't want us to move too quickly into application, but what might that next step look like? Because it's really easy to, to pluck a weed once and then forget it. What will it look like once we get back out into the chaos of the world? How will we continue to, to push back? How will we continue to create the space for the Lord to work? Do you find yourself drifting? Do you find yourself rooted? If you find yourself rooted, what are the practices? What are the things? Who are the people that help you stay rooted? If you find yourself drifting, what's, what's led to that? What do you need to release? What do you need to repent? Where is the Lord calling you and convicting you of your righteousness, the fact that you have been made lower than the angels only for a little while, but that is not your ultimate destiny, that is not your true identity? Where is reminding you that you are sons and daughters of the King, that the Lord's rule and reign is within you, and that you are a carrier of mercy and a recipient of grace. So what's your current trajectory? Where is your life heading? Are you the ship that's just drifting in the ocean? Or are you focused on the harbor and anchored to the Savior? What keeps you anchored? How seriously are you taking these anchors? And what helps you to become aware of his and remain in his presence? So continue to take some, some time to consider where you find yourself on the story, what the Lord is doing in your life. And what does it look like to continue to remain anchored, to weed the garden, to till the soil, to prune the vine? to produce the fruit, to see the Lord continue to work in us to bring that fruit to fruition. So when we hear God's voice, we remember, we remind, and we rejoice. So we remember that Jesus is greater than our present joys and concerns, our past sins, and our future hopes. And we remind others and we rejoice in the fact that Jesus is our present joy that he has forgiven our past sins and that he guides us to and is our future hope. Just continue to pray with me before Sean continues to lead us in singing. Lord, where do you have us? Where are we in this story? What are you calling to our attention. Where are we fighting you? Where are you inviting us to trust where we're just holding on to the ground? Or where are you working and where we are responding? Where we praise you for your goodness that you are so good, you are worthy of our trust. So Lord, we accept who you have made us to be. Would you help us to grow? Would you surround us by people that will, will help us, that we can serve, that we can encourage? Affirm in us the gifts that we have, 
Help us to trust in you to take these risks and remember your faithfulness. Remember the moments that you have carried us. Remember the moments that you have lifted us up. And that these would not lead to pride. That this would lead to the continued softening of our heart. That you could imprint your nature upon us. That we would let go of success by worldly standards. That we would kill our ego and enter into an abiding love with you. Let's stand this morning.